All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm recording this as a reminder, and I forgot to um, say in the beginning, uh, it was good to meet uh, several of you at the technical conference. It's always good to, um, you know, put a put a face uh, or a, in a voice with an actual person and know that you guys aren't all generated by AI. Um, to follow up on the question Mr. Kathan had about um, uh, some of the overlap between our um, work group and the interconnection work group, or, or maybe it was Mr. Bar or Dr. Bartlett uh, on the utility solar ready energy system. Uh, I'll read you what I got back from John. Um, he essentially said, not seeing it now. Oh, wait, uh, there it is. He said, uh, the missing piece is the forecasting to determine the need to do forward-looking hosting capacity upgrades. Um, so there's no need for the interconnection work group to pursue um, hosting capacity upgrade plans any further based on the new regulations. So, um, so we have to figure out the forecasting part of that. I hope that makes some sense. All right. All right. Uh, okay. Yes, it did. Thank you for responding. I feel like I'm at home talking to my daughters. Yes, Mr. Bartlett. Oh, yeah. It's just, I, I didn't know whether the corollary to that was that we should uh, maybe take a look at that uh, plan that the utilities had put into the interconnection working groups to know what's in there. Uh, I the, think the solar ready energy system. I think that's a very good idea. I'm going to put that on my to-do list, and I'll, we'll have to go over that at the end. Uh, but it is growing as we speak, so it's um, starting to become a little daunting. So. You're going to have to get your own AI. <laughs> that would be good. Uh, somebody to do this report and somebody to run the meetings and someone to generate some more time. All right. Uh, okay. All right, so let's talk about grid needs and DER value assessments. Um, one thing that I, I don't know if we're necessarily taking this out of order, um, was uh, the utilities weren't big fans of coordinating with um, the gas utilities as proposed by OPC um, to address the, uh, potential of the increase of load from gas customers translate uh, transitioning to electric as well as allowing um, you know the electricity uh, electric utilities to plan accordingly and the and the gas utilities to plan as well um, OPC did you guys have a response to uh, the utilities on that yeah I can start um... Tim, you know, feel free to jump in. I, I think my first inclination is that I don't, I don't know that this is necessarily out of scope. I certainly understand that there are planning activities that go beyond just distribution, but there's most definitely a tie-in between distribution plans and gas plans, and to the extent that utilities. Um, you know, operate or, or have parent companies that that operate both, there needs to be coordination between the two. And, you know, in other words, if there is a a need for, for example, electrification is, is you know, widely expected to continue to be deployed in the state and electrifying things that are currently gas is most definitely going to have an impact across both the electric distribution system and, you um, across the gas system as well. So I I think our only, our, you know, our primary point on that is that there needs to be coordination between the two. Um, Tim, I saw you just jump on camera, so feel free to, to add any color on top of that. Um, yeah, I would also definitely push back on it being out of scope. I think, um, I think there's two points here is that, or like two facets of this basically. One facet of this is simply just information and what we're, what information we're using to plan the system. And I don't think that like any information that's useful to system planning should be out of scope. Um, the second part of it is 
potentially this actual coordination of um, the actual coordination of planning with uh, gas utilities. Um, but uh, to the first point, I think it is entirely reasonable that um, we would want to, uh, you know, if we're, when we're looking at electric electrification loads, those loads are coming from gas. Like those loads already exist and they're on the gas system. So the best way to know what loads are gonna come from the gas system is to know what's on the gas system and understanding that information. Um, so that's kind of my first point of understanding, uh, especially as gas utilities start to decarbonize and potentially, um, you know, either uh, abandon new uh, gas expansion or actually to the point where we start to potentially decommission parts of the system, understanding what parts of the system are most affected by that which is going to drive electrification, that's something that's very useful to electric planning. On the second part, I, I would wanna say that um, while it is not the electric utilities business to plan the gas systems, um, nor is it the gas utilities to plan the electric system, that again, because these, these services overlap and that electrification is a transfer of service from gas utilities to electric utilities, it makes sense from the state standpoint to look at these things together. Um, and while you know all planning activities don't need to be done together, at least having an understanding of where the best locations are coordinated between where there is uh, available capacity on the electric system to take up electrification, as well as areas that would otherwise become, uh, say, like uh, a stranded assets on the gas system and basically coordinating those areas to to decommission those gas assets or uh, avoid a gas expansion in that area and use the electric system's capacity to electrify those loads uh, whether they be new or transitioned electrification um, i think that entirely makes sense from the state standpoint of like trying to do this transition as efficiently as possible. Okay, we got you. All right, anybody from, anybody else wanna weigh in on that? I, I understand the logic on it. Um, yes, Mr. Bartlett. Uh, yes, sir, I, I, I frequently agree with my colleagues from uh, Stratagen and OPC. On this one, I'm not so sure. Um, I wonder if we go back and look at the very detailed uh, electrification study that um, the electrification work group did, whether they haven't covered this territory already. And, um, and also, you know, we are talking about load. And the one thing that came out of the Brattle study was that the, the load can be managed. Now, what kind of generation handles it? becomes a problem for our longer term planning, but I'm not sure that throwing gas into this adds anything that the electrification study hasn't already done. All right, thank you, sir. Um, Ethan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bartlett, for bringing up exactly one of the points I was going to bring up. Um, yes, we, we actually believe that this load is very manageable. Um, and, um, the one thing, you know, as BG and E, by the way, uh, the, the G does stand for gas. Um, we, we're we're pretty good at coordinating within ourselves. There is coordination with WGL and other gas utilities. I happen to have personally done a lot of that when I worked on the uh, District of Columbia undergrounding program, where there, uh, the, you know, all the utilities share a certain amount of right of way underground, but we have to. Um, you know, coordinate our equipment because you can't have gas lines and electric feeders too close to each other. There's all kinds of things about that. There is a lot of going back and forth. A ton of communication happens that I think you would be surprised at the amount of email that is generated between our two distribution groups, distribution planning groups. Um, so, I, well, I understand where OPC is going, that there's more information is better. This is information we have. And, you know, we're really not going to need a, uh, we don't really need to know the gas load plan to plan for a, a new customer's electric heat pump. You know, these are not things that are going to cause a major amount of strain on our system. And this is just, 
uh, finally, there already is a, you know, uh, we set out of scope and OPC kind of glossed over the fact that we mean there's a whole other proceeding for this. So, you know, let's keep this to the distribution system planning. Let's try to stay within a certain scope so that we can get to our report in the next three months without having added in too many more um, additions that we are not going to be able to address easily amongst ourselves. So thank you all. Ethan, thank can you, you clarify you. which docket that is? I think it's, I think he's referring to 9707. It's OPC's petition um, to the, uh, the uh, about the uh, future of uh, natural gas. I'll look it up right now. It's um, uh, yes, it's a petition of uh, Office of People's Council for near term priority actions and comprehensive long term planning for Maryland's gas companies. And it's 9707. Um, okay. I don't think anything they've had a lot of comments that have been filed so far. I don't think anything has been scheduled. Um, so, okay. Thanks for pointing right. pointing us to those materials. We're we're happy to review and determine if we if we think it's reasonable to pull the, the recommendation out of this work group or or whether it belongs elsewhere. So yeah, yeah, and, and, back on that. yeah. I, I don't know if the commissions. I think the commissions essentially they've opened the docket, but I don't know that they've actually said where they're going yet. So, um, you know, if, if something happens between now and whenever and I find out about it, I'll certainly pass it along to the group. Um, Mr. Virchinsky and then uh, Samantha. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Um, I, I take Al's point and to the extent that information is provided from the gas utilities on what's going to happen with um, electrification load being increased, um, then I'm good with that. However, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm doing this myself and I see people who are getting totally off of gas. I mean, gas is being terminated in the street. They're going to uh, electrification uh, for their whole house and how is that going to impact the secondary system and even the primary system, um, the electrical system? I mean, uh, a lot of this is going to be point specific and you can't peanut butter this thing at all. So, um, you know, I'm more in favor of getting the information from the gas utilities and incorporating it um so that uh it's dealt with thank you thank you sir uh samantha thank you i just i have a clarifying question and i'm sure this has been answered before but i can't remember the answer um and i'll i don't know if i'll pick on bg bg and e or, or whoever wants to take it but for the utilities are your current load forecasts uh or, or let me back up or let me reverse that is customer electrification or assumptions about customer electrification factored into your current load forecasting process? So I can speak from DG um, in terms of what we put into our our load forecast for customer electrification. So uh, if customers do come to us with specific requests to heavy up because they are electrifying, um, that would make it into our load forecast, um, similar to a regular new business process. Um, and I mean, those are typically large customers, you know, greater than 250 kW. Um, so to the extent that they're electrifying, yes, that makes it into our load forecast, but you know, it, individual residential transitions from gas to fully electric um, are not, not currently in our load forecast. And, and to add to, to what Kevin just talked through, I think in our comments, you know, on boxes three and four around DER and load forecasting, you know, Kevin talked there through kind of our current forecast, but, you know, within our our, our future vision of, of that forecasting, you know, recognizing, looking to do that DER forecasting um, for the various aspects of that. So 
our, our comments there kind of speak to, you know, Kevin alluded to, to what we do currently and our comments there speak to kind of how we view uh, the future of that DER forecasting as well. Great, thank you. All right, uh, anybody else want to be heard on the gas issue? Because we can, we can always revisit it if need be. Okay. I did actually invite some of the uh, attorneys from the other distribution gas distribution companies that um, that are not BG&E, uh, but I don't, I'm not sure if they attended or not. So. Um, They'll be surprised if they get something out of this then. All right, let's see. O OPC, you guys had probably the most uh, substantial comments on um, grid needs and DER value assessments. Um, do you guys want to kind of give a, everybody a brief overview of those? Or, or if, you know, we can throw it out to the utilities to see, you know, more specific points as to information they're looking for or um, areas of disagreement. No, I, I can I can give us a, a brief overview. All right. Um, Thanks. Also, Thanks, Tim. Side, side note is is my internet like coming coming through okay? Yeah. Yeah. So good. Good. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I was getting a couple of glitches on maybe it's just my side, but just wanted to make yep. sure y'all can hear and see. Loud and clear. Yep. Honestly, yeah. you are coming in poorly for me. Oh, interesting. I mean, your picture's not as, as fine as it, you know, it's not as crisp, but I mean, other than that, I mean, we can hear you and, and see you, so take it away. I got my low, my low quality picture today. <laughs> um, okay, uh, let me just pull my notes up just so I make sure I hit the things I need to hit. Um, so I think our, our primary points here, I mean, and we've started talking about this a bit, um, are on uh, the changes in needs assessment um, and looking at, so our, our top three recommendations were um, hosting capacity upgrades, like a, a proactive hosting capacity upgrade uh, process um, and needs assessment, which I think we've, we have kind of touched on already a little bit, um, especially with like John's uh, presentation. Um, our second recommendation on that was uh, resilience and mitigation of climate risks. So just looking at um, explicitly at, you know, climate risks and um, areas that are uh, flood prone and um, potentially like storm, um, you know, vulnerable to storms as, as you know, storm activity becomes uh, a little bit more severe um, with climate change. And so looking at, at specifically those and the coordination of gas and electric planning, which was our third point that we just talked about. Um, and I think uh, kind of our point here basically being that uh, with this integrated grid planning, we're really trying to, there are more needs that we're concerned about. Um, there are, there are future needs of the grid that you know haven't necessarily been um as front and center um in grid planning and just kind of refocusing to make sure that we capture those in um in our plans um the second part we we spoke to the locational value um i think the biggest clarifying point that i think we should make here is that um we started kind of we started referring to this as a value of der uh we prefer that terminology simply because um, value DER is what we see is like the, the, the higher level, um, larger scope. Um, locational value is is a is within the value of DER. Um, and so DER can provide both this locational uh, capability to solve constraints on um, individual circuits, to provide reliability, that kind of thing. Um, but it also provides, um, you know, larger system-wide benefits as well. Um, and while you can talk about the locational values separately, um, if you're going to talk about uh, compensation methodologies, for example, we think that that really needs to be a holistic conversation. 
about how you compensate these, thing, these things because you, um, and I'm sure, you know, the utilities will agree, we don't want to double count um, how we uh, are compensating. And so it's important to kind of look at the whole picture of the DER value when you're trying to make a compensation mechanism. And I think that the compensation mechanism discussion is something that we need to at least talk on, um, even if we don't go into great detail in this working group. All right, thanks, Tim. Um, Jacob, Ethan, you guys got anything? Yeah, okay, that was a quite a list. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, let's let's agree that ho put hosting capacity upgrade process to the side for now. That's a that is a forecasting issue. I think that we need to have separately the the hosting capacity forecasting. Okay, that's and that's a big issue in itself. So let's put that one aside. Um, resiliency and climate mitigation. Very happy to be having that conversation. Um, go way back on resiliency. Worked on one of the district's first resiliency programs back in 2018. Um, you know, resiliency metrics were the, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the crux of the commission's order regarding BG&E's MYP uh, proposal for resiliency, for resiliency investments. The summary of that is basically uh, 1898. Uh, we had them do a uh, study of our system, uh, areas that would be um, climate, would be climate um, vulnerable and that you know we were looking for what, where we could invest to harden the system in such a way that when a climate related uh, weather happened that our customers were not forced to pay pay for a piece say a transformer that had just been put in to pay for it to be replaced because a derecho like lightning struck that piece of that brand new transformer and forced it to be replaced is a, that's the example I always go to in my head is and that comes from watching Dominion's transformers exploding one by one during the 21 derecho. It looks sort of like a really bad 4th of July, uh, 4th of July celebration. Um, so that said, the commission said that they wanted a, there to be another proceeding to discuss resiliency metrics. Now, recognizing that resiliency metrics are an issue that has been struggled with since I got into grid modernization in 2018. Um, this is something that the national labs have struggled with. Everyone struggles with. How do you actually put a metric to resiliency as opposed to just reliability? So that said, I think we need to have a uh, another discussion, but also recognize that um, resiliency was put to a, another. The commission said that there is going to be a proceeding about that. It is an undefined. I'm guessing it's going to be a working group like this one. That's just me as a, a guy who does lots of working groups and, well, butters my bread with them. So um, what I'm saying is, yes, we want to have that conversation. We do believe resiliency is very is a vital conversation. What next steps we can take there are, I think, kind of in the commission's ballpark right now. Judge, you may correct me there. Well, um, well, now, well you, you said another proceeding. Are they? Are you reading that resiliency in the metrics coming out of the most recent MYP, or is this a different order? This is in the MYP. Um, okay. And plan to establish an administrative docket to consider the implementation of. Yeah. Well, DeAndre's got his hand up. Yes. DeAndre, you want to weigh in on this one? Or do you know the answer quickly? Um, well, the utilities are required to have a resiliency plan. How they are measuring resiliency at this point in time and the metrics that they're using internally to kind of determine what those resiliency plans are is something that utilities are left to determine as of now. There hasn't been any ruling in regards to specific metrics or standards by the commission at this moment, but I'm sure sometime down the future there will be. But if they are required to have resiliency plans, I, my assumption is that they have internal metrics that they're using to determine what is resiliency. All right. Thank you, sir. And, and Ethan, I think you're correct. Um, certainly sounds like it's 
for those of you who like working groups, a strong possibility that we'll have another one. Um, or it could be some other kind of proceeding. So um, I guess more to follow on that one. Yeah. But um, would like to note, you know, we bg and &E did put forward a resiliency plan um, also. Uh, if you want to check out T&D World, I do have an article on resiliency for uh, disadvantaged communities. Uh, some studies on that. It is a very vital conversation. We've put forward um, grant applications to meet for resiliency for uh, disadvantaged communities. Both PHI and bg and &E have done so. These are, um, you know, these are the nascent issues of our day. So, you know. This is a conversation we should definitely keep having. Sure. Now, there was one more piece, though. Ethan, before, I, before, yeah. I, before you jump off, uh, you said the BGE did a, a resilience plan. Was that part of the electrification plan that got carved out of the uh, most recent MYP? Both in the MYP, separate plans. Right. Okay. All right. Thank it, you. It was right. an 1898 study. and. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know much more about it, honestly. Okay. Right. Just by and, the way, I just, I just, wanna, I just, I'm sorry. I just want to say I do agree with that resiliency is something that definitely needs further discussion. I agree with that, but I, I do feel that it would be interesting to see the resiliency plans that utilities already have set, which will probably lead to more discussions as to what specific metrics could be used, but. Um, so I definitely agree with what Ethan is saying, but I just wanted to point out that each of the utilities do have existing resiliency plans. Do they file? Uh, do they file them with the commission? John, ready to know? I mean, have you seen them? They're not. Re they're not required to file them with the commission at the moment. Okay. But they're required to have them if we were to request them. Got you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ethan. I'm sorry. I cut you off, sir. No, not at all. That's your 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 honor. You're allowed to cut me off as often as you like. <laughs> um, finally, <laughs> in the okay, list, um, locational value. Um, okay, we would really like to discuss locational value and and, and a broader scope, and we need to get some definition here. Um, we've had this has also come up in the uh, energy storage program work group, and a certain event extent to the um, interconnection work group. I know MEA has requested a locational value. And, you know, when we, I, I probed that a little at the technical conference last week with uh, the national lab, and they only saw um, the value as the value of deferred, you know, non-wire solutions, the value of deferred wire solutions. And that's, we need to find a, a better way of talking about this amongst ourselves, because right now we're not sure where, you know, uh, Timothy said that locational value will provide larger system-wide benefits as well as locational ones. What are these benefits? And you know, I've pulled a some literature. I've found, again, deferral of capacity upgrades or inversely, resource adequacy, which from the point of view of a utility is actually the same thing. Um, the, you know, this locational value, what are people actually seeking here? We can talk about value generally, but I, I especially from OPC's team, I, I request more discussion or um, definition of what kind of value they are, you know, what kind of value streams they're seeing and then how the utility should be involved in that because many of those streams are more the um the jurisdiction of, of the developers i mean that's just we we provide a system which provides value to the der's by implementing it the network necessary for them to operate what value they provide to our system beyond a certain amount of black start capability recently has been added you know there's a few things you can find but we need to really get down and, and discuss that if we want to assign some kind of a locational value study like is recommended by MEA and others. So that was a long answer to say, I've got questions. Okay, sounds good. Well, hopefully we got people with the answers. Tim, you're nodding your head. So, and I can speak a bit to this from some of our experience. So this is something that we're working through with um, in Illinois. Uh, this is something that they are, they have an explicit, um, requirement to do from their 
Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, I think, um, from maybe 2020 or 2021. Um, but basically, uh, what we're looking at there is um, multifold. And that's part of the reason, I think, why I highlighted kind of like the holistic approach is that, um, you know, you have, uh, to your point, like the, the larger like deferral stuff, which you're not wrong that all of this comes back to deferring investments. It's just where those investments are. Um, and so you, you have starting at the locational level, um, there are direct, you know, the, the type of and non-wire solutions types of, uh, non-wire alternative, like, um, avoiding transformer upgrades and, you know, reconductoring and those types of things. Um, but you also have line losses. You also have, um, uh, quality, like service quality, voltage, frequency, that type of thing, um, support for those as well. Um, and then beyond that, you have more system wide type of, of looks at, um, the actual value of the energy, um, so uh, losses can also be looked at on, on the, the grander scale of, of the system losses, as well as peak load reduction um, for reducing, you know, the capacity at, at the market, basically, at the, the exchange interchange. Um, so, yeah, so basically, the main things being your actual deferral of capacity investments, your line losses, and your... Um, services for uh power quality okay uh if i may just i know people are in line and ahead of me but if i could just speak to a few of those things before we, we go far afield no, no, uh, please go ahead okay um that's you see and this is exactly why i've been struggling with this question um for one thing voltage solar technically is actually uh works against us on voltage um and let it it, it, it's not uh, it, it, that's why we have hosting capacity is one of the main reasons is that the voltage situation that solar causes i'm not really sure about line losses but i know that they're really minor especially at the distribution level so i'm not sure what der's are going to uh add in there and a lot of this can be dealt with by with smart inverters um and finally and this was something that came up in the technical conference that i wanted to talk to this group about i i've a I've alluded to it before. Um, we're moving away from what I would call the New York Rev model of non wires alternatives to wires alternatives. You put these two items out there in a bucket and say, hey, which one, you know, which one uh, benefit cost analysis works better and that's which solution we're going to go with. That was not been successful. Um, mm -hmm. And that happened in Colorado. You may have heard uh, the, the uh, National Lab representative. And um, National Lab representative mentioned that she was surprised by the Colorado RFP that got no results. I was not surprised by that because it's what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from developers. They don't want to bid against two solutions. They want a defined project. They want a utility to say, we want a battery here. For these specific reasons, these are the revenue streams. It's going to work in the PJM market, provide reliability and capacity. These, this is what it does. And they want it, that's how they want these projects to come packaged for their bidding. So we're, we're probably going to need to move away from this idea of the deferral, unless it's an extremely large item like a substation where the deferral is really have a great magnitude and obvious. And so I say that because we need, in order to get to a locational value of DERs that is functional and actually sends price signals to developers, we're going to have to find another way to define it. And um, one of my engineers is noting reduction of carbon dioxide is the major value. And thank you, Solar, for bringing it, that to our system. So uh, again, I'm always here with a lot more caveats and questions than answers, but I wanted to give people our perspective on that. Thank you. I can uh, give a little bit of, uh, and and actually, I don't I don't disagree with you on uh, so the specifically that non wires alternative um, discussion. I I don't disagree with you that um, 
yeah, we, we, we would probably also like to look at non wise alternatives, not as just like these, yeah, just like two different things that you fight against, um, that you compare. Um, and I think actually where I'm going even more so with, uh, this non wise alternative capacity, uh, deferral is actually more towards looking at the value of capacity reductions on either the local system or the larger uh like a, a local feeder local circuit and on the larger system um and looking at it more as we know that you know every kilowatt or every megawatt you reduce in demand you will reduce your your investment over time in terms of capacity and so actually it's one of the things that i i think we would advocate um on our side for is is looking at the value of decreasing load over time through DERs or reducing demand over time with the ERs. And that's kind of more what I mean by this capacity deferral. Interesting thought. We, we should definitely, can you stick that in the chat for us? Sure. That's when we need to take back. That's interesting. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, Tim. Um, Dr. Bartlett and then Joyce. Yeah, thank you. And this, this discussion has moved over actually a lot of territory. We sort of started with resilience and now we're on locational value. So let me see if I just a few points on both of them. But it seems to me an overarching theme here is definitional clarity, which we seem to be seeking for both of those things. For um, locational value, I just wanted to um, remind Ethan of the discussion we had a while ago of the lolly, the famous lollipop circuit, which is where you've got a long feeder and then a population cluster out at the end of that circuit and where having a distributed energy resource on that circuit might actually provide um, protective value um, and maybe even um, quality value uh, to that circuit. But and that's just one example. But again, my point is uh, we really need to think more clearly about what what are those components of of locational value in that context i would say that there have been a couple of uh, large scale at least state level uh location value studies done so maybe we should look at those and see what they used as categories um that might be one way to to take us forward and the same issue about definitional clarity um in terms of resilience uh paul de martini in the technical session uh offered uh, some frameworks and they were only frameworks so they don't solve the problem for us but they're useful because they for example um broke reliability down into two major categories one is the one we, we were mainly talking about and the ones that the utilities are already dealing with which is um grid or distribution system vulnerability in which case the threats have changed and um Oh, Di Martini's overarching um, his what he called his bow tie analysis framework um, starts with identifying what are the threats. And so, you know, weather threats have changed. Uh, human threats have evolved, unfortunately, or devolved, um, and so on. So, so there's need for identifying the specific threats that we need to address, and then what are the potential remedies and also on the other side of the bow tie is what happens if it have what if, what if that threat actually is realized how do we mitigate it and how do we uh repair it and if possible how do we prevent it um but the other the other category was customer and community vulnerability and ethan alluded to this when he was talking about the the work that they're doing with uh, virtual power plants or microgrids or whatever with certain communities but systematizing that and looking at customer and community vulnerability um, is an additional aspect that is not traditionally included, but that we definitely need to be thinking of. And it's already in the thinking, but not systematically. So again, I think it just comes back to um, systematizing our thinking um, about what do we talk, what problems are we talking about, and what are the potential solutions or mitigating approaches to deal with them. And finally, in terms of value of DERs, just to remind everybody that um, the PSC does have actively underway now, case after some delay, uh, case 9674 to develop 
a unified cost benefit analysis for DER, so that fits the definition that that OPC is proposing, uh, using a an existing methodology, which is the National Standard Practice Manual methodology. So we need to keep that one in mind. We, that's that's a wheel we definitely don't want to reinvent. All right. Thank you, sir. Joyce, I, um, I promise I'm coming to you. Let, let me get Ethan to respond if you, if you want, sir. Well, I want to say thank you, Dr. Bartlett, for bringing up my favorite uh, lollipop feeder and the um, as well as the uh, value of DER of uh, to of resiliency in these projects who, you know, most of all provide resiliency, especially to disadvantaged communities. And in both of those cases, you're looking at really the same value stream, which is a community that is going to be more vulnerable. And just for those who don't understand, a lollipop feeder is, well, is generally a long vulnerable radial feeder that is subject to a lot of reliability uh, challenges, we'll call it, and oftentimes trees or storms, squirrels. Um, the uh, By co-locating solar and storage at the end of it, and there was a project that was brought up it, again at the technical conference that um, in South Carolina, where the, there was a solar and storage co-location project. I happened to have interviewed the guy who designed that project when I was first getting into uh, designing microgrid projects, and um, you know that was the problem they were addressing. These get to the same value, which is we can't. <laughs> yes, Al, dead squirrels. Um, it is very difficult to, um, uh, you know quantify the value of resiliency to a group of customers. But when you know that they're getting a lot of outages, when you know that they're a disadvantaged community, these projects, there is a qual there's a definite qualitative argument for them. And you know, that is an area I would like, I hope this group could help explore more. We often always want to say, establish a numeric value for the benefits to customers. There comes a point when we need to say these customers are being less are being more poorly served than comp comparable customers. Qualitatively, we need to do something extra for them. And that's where resiliency comes in, in my opinion. All right, thank you, sir. Joyce, thanks for being so patient. Yeah, so I think I just want to clarify, and Ethan, I know you've had, um, you've probably talked more in depth with you know our team, David Comas, but I just want to kind of just reiterate when I go back to the team, some things that you and Tim just said, and I think I heard you say for locational value and you know we don't, the terms, we're, that's what we were looking at. And I think when you said for non-wire alternatives, um, I think that you used the Con Ed example and said that, that the utilities are moving away from that. Right, and so I think in our comments we had said, "Hey, we want the location of values because for two reasons: one, where should we as MEA be incentivizing some solar, and two, um, you know, could it be using the Con Ed example that we can have some avoided costs?" And I think I just want to go back to the second one. I think I just heard you said that 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 avoided cost is no longer valid or that it just didn't work or you'd have to, I think I heard you say it'd have to be a whole lot of solar for there actually to be avoided costs. So help help me out with that. Well, I think Con Ed just, was, I believe you're referring to the New York Rev. I, I don't know what it was. It was a Brooklyn Queens. It was 2014. Brooklyn I think Queens. it was 52 megawatts yeah. if that's the same one. Yeah. It's it was, one it was a long actually, time ago. It's actually the, 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 probably the original grid modernization proceeding. Okay. And, you know, it, it is for a number, it was for a number of customers that actually dwarf what we have in uh, BG and E and PHI combined. Okay. Um, and yeah, it was going to be a huge major substation. They've uh, held multiple uh, RFPs that have been somewhat successful. Some were for demand response, some were for smaller projects. But in general, across the country, uh, you know, we actually in, you know, I, I helped replicate a, pro a process like New York Rev once. RFP did not work out. Uh, what I would call well, um, RFPs for utilities across the country for this comparison yeah. is not working well because you end up, the wire solution is probably going to win. The developers don't want to spend the O&M on developing a proposal and competing against three other developer proposals plus this wires proposal in order to not be um, not be selected. It's just not worth it to them as a 
you know, from a business case. And so that's why we are trying to move towards defined projects. We know we want a battery here. We know that this battery will provide following benefits, resiliency, reliability, and otherwise PJM marketplace to go with the classic set. You know, that's this is where the value streams will come from. And the defined projects where we are simply asking developers to bid on a battery storage project here, who can build it the best, most efficiently for us. So that's how we're looking at it these days. This is, and as far as you know, solar goes, solar again is a you know different than storage. Yeah. Best paired with storage, Reese's peanut butter cups, two two great tastes. Um, but you know, solar presents a different set of problems because it actually has impacts on the system that are uh, you know the opposite of perhaps where we would like to go, which is why we have the hosting capacity maps. Voltage situations happen. And that's actually, you know, gets us to the lollipop feeder feeder that uh, Al mentioned. When you have that long feeder way out, you know, in a rural area, that uh, that solar can really jump up the voltage up out out there at the end. Storage helps mitigate that, holds it down, and also uh, allows you to use that spread that ducktail from the solar generation across more usefully across the uh, the time frame. So. You know, the, these things aren't as <sighs> locational value is tough. It's it's also temporal, and you know we understand people's interest in wanting to create price signals, but it, it's it needs more definition before we can really do that because you know, looking at benefits to the system, quote unquote, there aren't a lot of well defined ones at the distribution level. At the PJM level, things are much easier to to monetize, but at the distribution level, we've got smaller devices already doing So that was a lot of answers to your question, Joyce. No, no, I got it. I just wanted to get the contours. Okay. Great. Well, frankly, I'm not an engineer, so contours is all I can give you. Yeah, that's all I can understand. So we're good. Thanks. No problem. All right. <clears throat> all right. Uh, yes, sir, Dr. Bartlett. Oh, I just wanted to, Ethan just said again, we need definitional clarity. And I just want to keep coming back to that. How are we going to get that definitional clarity? I mean, these are good discussions. And then, you know, we'll go away at three o'clock. And um, but there needs to be some kind of a, a structured approach to these questions. This one, you know, I think the 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 value one for locational value, I I, I think that this group is perhaps pretty well positioned to look at other examples and, and think of what some of the components are so that we can begin to talk about them, not just conversationally. And for um, the uh, reliability piece, again, I thought that the Martini's framework um, would be helpful if we actually looked at what are the threats specifically in terms of the grid, what are the threats specifically in terms of, uh, how do we define vulnerability of a community. To some extent, one of the points he made, Demartini, was that that would benefit from some um, community and customer input. Um, but again, if we can look at what what are the parameters, what are we talking about? Um, once we have clarity about on those uh, specifics, then we can say, is this something that we should be including in our thinking about the planning process? Is this something that we actually do and how would it be done? All right. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. And I know people keep coming back to the definition, and I'm sure there's plenty of definitions out there. There's no need to recreate the wheel. Maybe we can uh, take one uh, that some other state has used and kind of tweak it to make it uh, Maryland specific. Um, but that is that, along with uh, several other things, is on my to do list for that um, or for the next next time. All right. Um, all right. So Ethan, is it fair to say you can't you, the utilities can't weigh in on whether or not the value of a locational uh, study would be the locational value study would be until you know what we're talking about in a nutshell? I think Ethan had to step away for a second, um, right. but um, 
Yeah, I, obviously, I think this discussion has helped kind of provide some clarity on people's okay. perspectives. Obviously, Ethan's kind of weighed on a lot of kind of okay. where we see it already, but, you know, this conversation's definitely helped. All right, good. All right. Um, anybody else want to talk about locational value? Yeah, I'm, I'm maybe yes. maybe hoping you can you can clarify how you're envisioning maybe like moving moving that conversation forward. If you know, I I think it's an important piece to include oh. within the discussion. It's a piece of jade, right? Um, sure. So, in order to continue with the discussion, maybe the utilities providing a definition that they're willing to work with and, and that would allow us to move forward with the discussion might be a reasonable path forward. Open to alternatives, though. Okay. Well, yeah, I know we we've got we haven't had great luck with picking definitions so far um and i'm not you know i, I totally agree with you i no. don't it's i don't think it's our job as the work group right to to come up with new definitions and spend weeks right, on right. refining those uh but i do think it's a, it's it's a discussion that needs to happen and if we need a definition to do it i would be great to agree upon one sure sure um Jacob, Eli, potentially oh, okay. less definitions and more components that would be relevant and inclusive in such a locational value study, right? Totally. Yeah, okay. that's exactly what I'm getting at, Tim. Agreed. Okay. All right, Jacob. Yeah, I mean, I think we can take that back. Like, because I think Ethan outlined a lot of kind of where we're we were already at, based on kind of as as he was hearing it, kind of outlining some of the challenges that we see existing with some of the locational value, um, and we can put that further into comments uh, um, to provide ahead of the, the next working group. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. All right, um, doc, uh, Mr. Virchinsky. Uh, yeah, this is uh, kind of not in my skill set, but the only comment I made on this, just as an outsider looking in, I thought that this would be uh, dealing with congestion on the grid, where uh, you would provide to uh, uh, developers points at which you needed to ameliorate the congestion on various speeders um, and transformers through use of other devices. Um, I, I don't know if that's where people are coming from, but that was kind of the concept that I was working with. Um, be happy to have, hear others speak up on it. Thank you. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, I think that, yeah, I, I think that we're in agreement with that. I think, um, yeah, what I kind of mean by capacity deferral is exactly eliminating um, those types of congestion. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, Jake, have you got anything? Yeah, I, mean, I think Ethan kind of talked a little bit about that of, you know, we, we've seen challenges of when there are constraints putting a capital project, you know, in a comparison to a non-wire and some of those RFP processes, but still do evaluate those projects for, you know, addressing those type of constraints and, and identify, as Ethan talked about, you know, specific projects like a battery um, to address them to, de to defer some of those capital costs. It looks like you're muted, Judge. Thanks. So uh, it was very profound. Uh, so it, it sounds like we're kind of on the same page, generally. Yeah, I, I think okay. in certain aspects of it, yes. Right. Um. <laughs> All right. All right. So we're on the in the same book, maybe different different chapter. All right. Um, All right. Next thing. Um, MEA brought up uh, the smart bi-directional grid. And I know folks have talked about bi-directional grids um, kind of throughout um, a little bit. We've touched on it throughout this process. Um, and I, I don't know if you guys, if you guys, the utilities weighed in directly on bi-directional grid. No, I don't think we had any original comment. I believe MEA was kind of just asking for additional information for what the utilities plans are. Was that correct? Yeah, we we just kind of put it in. I wasn't weren't sure if it went into those blocks, but it's just you know just as BG&E did, 
what's the plan? And, and to ask what we ask for is a report, like what's going on with bi-directional flow? How can we look at it? Um, yeah. Gotcha. I know, and you know, curious to just understand more of, um, we talk about that in various different venues through different working yeah. groups. So is that is that sufficient or are you looking for something officially filed or some type of formal report around kind of what the utilities are doing within that? Um, it'd just be helpful to understand further kind of what exactly that looks like. I, I don't think we're necessarily opposed to talking about it. I just recognize we already talk about it in various different venues. True, and, and we've seen it. I think what we were saying in the context of this and this work group and that should there be you know, in, in a distribution system planning, should there be a report? Should there be, you know, we've seen Nevada, we've seen in, in other states that they have a formalized process and here's your annual report. And so that would be something that would be interesting to consolidate it in one place. So I don't have to go to the EV bus docket and this, you know, um, just to kind of look at it because it is, sure, it's part of the grid of the future. And so we just wanted to put a little asterisk to maybe, we'd, we'd love to see a little more of that consolidated. No, and I'm glad you brought it up, Joyce, uh, in MEA, because it is a statutory requirement in 7802 um, about bi-directional grids. And like I said, you know, we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but to the extent that um, the utilities can tell us what they're doing, how they're moving towards it, because it doesn't sound like, uh, at least initially, um, I don't want to say you, that you're not big fans of the bi-directional grid, but you know that's not how the grid is currently constructed. Is that... Well, I mean, you know, today solar generates right. onto the grid, right? right. You know, we've, right. we've through various different venues of that. Batteries generate onto the grid, you know, obviously mm -hmm. considerations for things like V to G coming, right? So I, I think, you know, very historically the grid hasn't been that way, but over the last decade okay. or so, it's been right. continuing okay. to evolve in that direction. All right. And I, I just kind of view into this, Jacob, if you don't mind me poking in with a uh, in the past couple of weeks, actually, I got a view into this a little more as I've been asking these questions of people. And um, bidirectionality is going to be a function of DERMS, which is on its own IT implementation path. And I know I punt to the IT implementation a lot, but that's just where many, a lot of this is going. Um, so it's a function of IT implementation and a lot of upgrades to substations. Um, it is a long-term project. I think that I believe that the CSNA or um, maybe one of the commission orders, um, uh, I believe that it, one of them, there is a requirement we come out of this process with reporting on our movement towards that. I think that that's something I would be happily agree to, uh, you know, we could agree to. Um, so it's just, you know, it, it's gonna be a long-term process. And, saying where we are in it, it's a lot of technical detail that I don't understand, honestly. But um, it is something that's going to be happening. Yeah, no, Ethan, that, that's great. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to speak for Joyce, but I know I'm not looking for like the, I don't know the detail you're talking about, but it is a statutory requirement. So I, it, at least if we can, you know, have the utilities lay out, you know, how they're, what they're doing, how they're doing it, you know, when it, you know, with some 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 goals, uh, some goalposts. Um, I think that would be helpful for for us, um, Joyce, and then uh, Eric and Eli. Yeah, and then what the you know what the considerations are. I know that you know for some cars, some can do it. Like, what are the blockages? You know, things like that. It just kind of helps us know in the state what's where we're we going. You know, what are some of the issues? I know some of it is obviously technology dependent and. Uh, it just helps us keep a beat on it, fulfill our statutory requirements, but also just kind of know. So yeah, we, we're a little bit vague on the details, but because we don't have we don't have a lot. No problem, uh, Eric. Yes, a, a few clarifying questions, if I may. One is, was was the 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 request around um, bidirectional um, inverters? Um, from an EV perspective or bi-directional capabilities on the distribution system? I think it's overall for the system. Um, okay. 
All right, yeah. thanks. I, 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 I was one of the reasons for the clarifying question was the last statement that was um, shared by Ms. Lombardi. Um, the in I, I just want to pull pull on a string a little bit. Ethan mentioned um, that the BG the BG um, um, utility is is actually deploying a a derms. Um, but I, I just want to share that it's a culmination of, of multiple capabilities that um, needs to be available on our systems on a feeder by feeder, station by station, um, to, to, to really shore up that, use the term very loosely, and we are using it very loosely now, bidirectional. Because the, and the, the reason, and I, I, I think job, the judge shared, you know, um, our system are traditionally developed for, for, for load serving. It has to do a lot to do with a lot with the protection um, capabilities that were deployed on the system and, and where we are at each feeder, each station with, um, with upgrading protection schemes. Um, bi-directional, by the way, bi-directional doesn't mean that the feeder cannot accommodate um, PV, just, just to provide some clarity there, right? Bi-directional does not mean that the feeder cannot accommodate PV, right? Bi-directional in the essence here is really having um, the flow of power going back in the opposite direction on the um the breaker um when the in the in the feeder or through the transformer in the substations right those uh, uh, just for clarity so we can have we can have uh pv on the system right and and the feeder is never in bi-directional because there's enough load at the time that the pvs are are, are operating but um, in, but the systems can do some really um, interesting things from a protection perspective. If if power is flowing in the opposite direction within the protection zones on in the station, and also as we we do load transfers for abnormal conditions. So I wanted to just provide some additional information. In a in a in what um, Ethan shared in regards to derms, but there's also the protection capabilities that needs to be upgraded. Um, so um, from BG end, we've you know we've been we've been upgrading our uh, protection schemes with new capabilities over the past few years, at least from from I started in this industry. I won't I won't share when that was to age myself here. But um, we've 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 actually been making some headways, and we're leveraging some of those capabilities. But by no means are um, we're a hundred percent there. So just wanted to um, hope. Hopefully that that information helps to 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 level set the mind and provide some insight and transparency. Thank you, sir. Uh, Eli. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and I wanted to follow up. Uh, I guess primarily on the comment, uh, I believe it was from Ethan, that bi-directionality will come from a, a deployment of derms, which I don't necessarily disagree with entirely, but I think the way that was stated was that it's it's almost entirely dependent on derms. And and I would I would push back on that. You know, as as Eric just laid out, the utilities are currently doing things in order to create processes that allow that better allow for the bi-directional flow of energy and that is my understanding of what is statutorily required um and thanks for clarifying germs among other things ethan um that you know that speaks to what, what i was about to say which is that germs is the technology piece or it's, it's one of several potential technology piece pieces the other key piece is policy and that's exactly why we are here as this work group, right? It is our our job right now to develop recommendations regarding processes that uh, better allow bi-directional power flow. 
with the next step being developing regulations that that that, that allow pro processes um, that better allow power flow or sorry uh, bidirectional power flow. And so I just don't want to, or I, I guess I want to underscore the fact that while this, while the utilities are undergoing efforts to deploy technology capabilities, we also need to explore modifications to or the establishment of new HOMAR regulations that will better facilitate power flow and our bidirectional power flow. Um, and so I just, it's something that should be contained within the recommendations that this work group eventually sends up to the commission. Um, and so I just don't want us to kind of let that fall by the wayside, right? It's yes, technology is a, is a huge key piece, but policy changes are the other key piece. And, and that's, I believe, why we're here, or at least according to the commission's direction, why we're here. I would agree with that. All right. All right, anybody else want to weigh in on that bi-directionality piece? All right, all right. Um, is there anything in the comments that we have not discussed that folks want to touch on? everybody just asleep and they want to get out of here all right it, i was gonna say if nothing on the comments Jeff, <laughs> i did want to follow up on uh you know what your thoughts are on on kind of how we move forward um in response to john's presentation and namely the kind of like the four core areas that he highlighted uh, about overlap between his work group and this work group just right. curious if you have thoughts on how to move forward that conversation well I, mean, I think we i mean it's all stuff we're going to have to address um yeah. and uh i mean i think it's we're looking at longer meetings i certainly don't want to start moving to weekly meetings if we can avoid it but um you know i've got a list of like um, 10 things that um that we need to follow up on just from today um and my, my thought would be that i guess it was the der forecasting uh, for use in determining reserve hosting capacity, right sizing interconnection upgrades, and determine areas in need of hosting capacity upgrades. I got those three. Was there, was there, there was a fourth one, Eli? I, I think you mostly got it, Judge. It's in, uh, it's, um, if you pull up John's deck, yeah. it's his last slide, that middle section with the four sub bullets. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think one was determine, determination of uh, hosting capacity available. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, you, you've overall captured it. If we're going to come back to this, um, you know, in our next work group discussion, I think that's that's totally fine. Obviously, yeah. these issues are just now formally getting kicked over to this work group. So I totally understand right. that we're yeah. maybe not. Yeah, and, and to, I, I think I left out the first one just because I think we're kind of discussing that now, but obviously we need to delve a little bit more into that. So, um, Ethan. Uh, okay. Few items first um back to locational values since it's close to my heart um <clears throat> if anyone has any other locational value of der's and you know remembering that there are different types that they want to put out there i, I would encourage you to include that in your next comments um, always interested in hearing what you have to say see if what how we can evaluate that for our system um to uh, the strategy yes sir you may have dropped off uh but Jacob volunteered to come up with a locational value definition slash components. I did um, hear that, but I was hoping people would like, <laughs> would add some in. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, or or maybe more components of of what should be incorporated in locational value. And actually, and, I want wanted to get something close to my heart there, which is um, you know we really want to talk about how we can think in terms in these group and the other work groups, the locational value of for disadvantaged communities. These are the areas where we have the most, we can have the most impact as a work group. And, you know, if we can put them first instead of where they have traditionally in the history of redlining have been put last, that would be, I think, a phenomenal outcome from this work group. So, you know, if anyone has any areas they'd like to touch on there, that would be very helpful. Okay. Um, to the strategy team, wanted to ask um, if they have 
you know, what policy blockers they're seeing to bidirectionality. It's, you know, something that we're already looking at just as a utility. Um, what what they see needs to be added in. It's easier to evaluate a proposed regulation or proposed policy change if we know what they, they are looking for. And finally, congratulations to Eli. Eli, two years of strategy team I read. Congratulations on that. Thanks, Ethan. No problem. Yeah, to just to respond to that last, uh, well, not the congratulations piece, but thank you for that. But to the other piece, um, yeah, we we're, we're happy to take that back. Um, I think the by you know the bidirectionality piece. It's not that there are specific policies that do or don't exist that you know explicitly reference bidirectionality. It's more so the concept of bidirectionality and um, you know having to your point, having policies that don't cause barriers to increasing the bi-directionality of the grid or vice versa. So we can take that back and we can think through what some specific examples are of new regulations that can reasonably be proposed um, or regulations that can potentially be modified uh, if, if we view them as barriers. So we're, we're happy to take that as an action item. Thanks for calling that out. All right. And yeah, and I would also, sorry, I'll just, I'll also second what Al put in the chat uh, because that did stand out to me as something um, that Natalie presented on during the LBL um, presentation of the, the DSP uh, tech, technical conference the other day. Um, and so she did point to, you know, one, it's a best practice for states to explore value of DER2 and, and, and two, I believe she um, pointed to a couple of specific circumstances that Al put in the chat and, you know, we're happy to dig in as well to see if there are other reasonable examples and, and can follow up with those. But I think what Al put in the chat is, is at least a great starting point and looking at that and looking at Natalie's materials that, um, that, uh, the judge, I believe you sent around last week would also just be a good starting point to understand what value streams we're actually talking about when we're talking about locational value of DER. All right, thank you, Eli, and congratulations on your anniversary. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, um, okay, so this is what I've got in terms of following up literally just from today. This does not include the other 11 things that I have on my list. Um, so we've got bi-directional grid, um, utilities are gonna, provide us some of their timelines, plans, goals, and issues they're having. OPC is gonna look into any types of policy blocks that they've seen or experienced. Um, utilities, timeline and move forward. Oh, um, I think Ethan, you're gonna provide a timeline by which um, utilities were gonna move to quarterly updates of the hosting capacity maps, I think. Um, what that would look like. I think uh, we talked about the topology, the utilities are gonna follow up on that. Um, then we've got the four items that John referenced, determining hosting capacity, DER forecasting to determine reserve hosting capacity, right sizing, um, gosh, determine need of uh, hosting capacity upgrades. Um, Utilities, we're gonna follow up on uh, the cost estimation tools slash providing everything for developers in a one-stop shop to see what that would look like if it's possible. Um, that, oh, uh, the I think it's BGE or was it PEPCO that has the solar ready energy system that was provided in the uh, to the interconnection work group. Um, if you could send that around to the to everyone um, so we can have a look at that. So we can look at that in terms of hosting capacity upgrades. Then we've got locational value definition slash components. Um, and then we've got um, more on resiliency and reliability. Um, I, I, um, I know Al brought up the, uh, the bow tie um, I've got that as an action item, but I'm not sure why. Um, doc, Dr. Bartlett, are you out there? I can't remember what we wanted to do in terms of following up with that. 
and I can go back and watch. Sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, no, I just thought that that um, it, it's just an overall framework for achieving definition. So it, right. it okay. starts with what's what's the threat we're trying to deal with, and once okay. you get that, then then it's you know right. what what's how high is the risk, and what are the what are the preventive factors, and what are the mitigating factors, et cetera. Okay. So it it gets it's just a way of thinking systematically. Okay, more definitions, components. Are you thinking? Okay. All right. I will obviously um, email this out to everyone. Um, oh, last thing I've got. If anyone has anything uh, that they want to bring up or revisit uh, from the technical conference last week um, that we've that we we've already covered, you think we need to go back? Um, you know, we can we can do that as well. Um, Jacob. Yeah, I just want to clarify. I think the first follow-up you had read off, if I heard it right, was the utilities communicating about our bi-directional flow plans. And I don't recall that as an action. I think we were talking about as potentially if a report's developed, that's something that you know, we'll consider as like in including in that report, but I didn't think as part of this working group we had said we well, would talk well, through that. We need to we need to specifically address uh bi-directional but I'll read it right out. Uh, bi-directional power flows um, as part of uh, the work group. It's part of the statute. Okay. So um, I think what what I was looking for was um, what what the utilities plans are, what your goals, timelines, and any issues uh, that you're seeing, or obviously costs, uh, things of that nature. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? I think so. Okay. Yep. <laughs> well, Noting that may be difficult to gather in the short term and a plan to report that may be more within our capabilities. Right. And, and I think I'm just, I, I think uh, you and I were discussing this. I, I don't think we need any like, you know, you know, down to the feeder detail, but kind of a, a general overview of, of what, what the utilities are doing. Does that, is that more doable, Ethan? Uh, very generally. Okay, yeah, I, I think that's kind of at least what I'm I'm anticipating, but um, that's I just started I, delving into this a week ago. I'm not sure what I'm going to find. Right, right, and, and I get it, and it's just uh, you know if it's something we have to push down the road, that's fine. It's just I know it's one of the statutory requirements I had up here, and we kind of talked around it. So Joyce brought it up, so we should at least try to address it. Um, uh, Dr. Bartlett. Uh, yeah, and, and Al is fine. Um, so the technical conference was very rich, and uh, you asked about things we might want to go back and think about again. Scott Baker from PJM made a very interesting presentation about how distribution level planning really could and should affect uh, ISO planning and vice versa. And uh, I recall at the end, Commissioners Sutman and Richard said, we shouldn't just be building more transmission. We had this discussion about um, one of the power, the coal-fired power plants closing here in, in Maryland. Uh, they said, you know, don't just build more transmission, work with the states to look at the possibilities within the distribution system to mitigate the need for transmission uh, expansion. And so I don't know whether that indicates that we should go back and revisit. I'm not sure where we came out on that discussion, but uh, it, I, I'm not sure we got as sophisticated as what he was talking about. You're, you're muted, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm happy to revisit that, sir. Uh, I'm, I know we've talked about transmission uh, in the past, um, and I know the utilities have indicated that there is, uh, they do have uh, some coordination, I guess, with their own distribution and transmission planning groups. Um, and, and we can certainly revisit that, sir. Um, because I'm sure we didn't get to the detail Mr. Baker was looking looking at. All right. Anybody else? All right. All right. So we'll plan on 
meeting again on the 25th. Um, we get comments by the 18th uh, and any reply comments there too on the 23rd, that'd be great. Um, if we need a little bit more time, that's fine because I know there's there's a lot of issues that we touched on and some of them we got, um, some of the issues we got uh, delegated or, or punted to us from the interconnection work group. So, um, you know, if, if we have to spend more time on this, that's fine. Obviously, it's an important uh, subject. All right. Anybody else have anything? Yes, sir, Eli. I was just going to say thanks as always, Judge. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Eli. I appreciate it. All right. Well, uh, enjoy your weekend. And um, hopefully, uh, you know, this isn't too much of an ask. Uh, you know, if it is, just let me know. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Thanks take care. Take care.